Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand and give God all the glory, all the praise. It all goes to him. He went to the cross to purchase this Sunday to be a day of victory and reconciliation. He has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. And Paul said, be ye reconciled to God. We're not strangers. We're not pilgrims. We are citizens of his heavenly kingdom. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Come on, hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here this morning. Oh, what a powerful, powerful presence of Jesus is in this place. Hallelujah. And it is a great a privilege of ours, my dear wife and I, to be here with all of you. And we miss our blessed, beloved bishop this morning. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, powerful preacher this church has. Amen. Hallelujah. I remember him as a little boy. I helped raise him up. Hallelujah. We were in Texas Bible College together. We were the poor kids in the, in the, in the dormitories, my wife and I. We lived just across the courtyard from them. And, oh, the Fosters are so dear to our hearts. Amen. We miss Dr. Foster. What a wonderful man of God. Brother Foster's dad and mom, Patricia, and their whole family. And, and Pastor, we're going to wave at you this morning. He's watching all of us, so we better behave ourselves. Let's wave at Pastor this morning. We miss you, Pastor, and we love you. And we thank you for this honor to be here this morning. You may be seated. This church is to be honored because of its sacrificial giving and blessings to so many people. I wrote this this morning. I don't know how this church pays its bills. Y'all give so much to so many. How do you have enough to keep the lights on? Bless your heart. Pastor is such a benevolent giving minister, and he blesses so many in our church as being the leader of our growth pro program. He has blessed so many churches and so many districts, and he, I've said this about him. I've heard him preach camp meetings. He's the greatest camp meeting preacher we have in the United Pentecostal Church, because when he gets through he not only has blessed them, but he has given them direction. He gives them direction and instructions of church growth and uh, the blessings of the Lord for our future. So I thank God, Brother Brandon, thanks for being my armor bearer today. And Brother Lucas leading this service. Wasn't, you've got a great youth pastor and a great armor bearer. Great young people. Amen. And uh, Brother Lucas, I wrote down that taste and see. I thought that was great. Dear mercy. That was powerful. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I, <clears throat> I want to, uh, th this morning, I'm just going to register a little complaint that I have. And that is with the religious world looking down on Pentecost. It's not fair. Because the Wall Street Journal says that New York City is the city of Pentecost. I have preached a lot in New York City, my wife and I. We've spent the whole month there last year, the month of October. And our churches are booming. There are churches all over town. Uh, there's just hundreds and hundreds of Pentecostal churches in storefronts in New York City. And it is the, the growing, booming church of the world. I saw on the Drudge Report here lately that Pentecost, uh, that uh, Christianity, China is now a Christian nation. That was the Drudge Report. Anybody ever heard the, of the Drudge Report? That's the most frequent, uh, most accurate uh, news uh, distributor. And China is now a Christian nation. There are so many getting the Holy Ghost. Brother Tenney told me 
that it's really shaking the nation. I, I thank God for what God is doing in the Philippines, what he's doing in India, what he's doing in America. Our churches are growing. Our people are in revival. This church is in revival. This church is in revival. <clears throat> In our travels, we preach in three great leadership churches. Palm Bay, Florida, Columbia, Mississippi, and the First Church of Dallas. Not that they're the biggest, but they are the, the givingest to leadership and exampleship of revival in our day. And I think we ought to give our church a round of applause. First Church, First Church. Can everybody say amen? Amen. And I, I am tired of people downplaying Pentecost. As far as a religion goes, you can downplay us because we're not a religion. We don't care what you say about religion. We're not a religion. We are a move of God's presence. We are a spiritual entity. And if God will help me this morning, I want to preach to you on the magnitude of Pentecost. The magnitude, not how little it is, but how great it is, how powerful it is. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Why don't we thank God for what is in this room right now? Yes, hallelujah. I'm reading from St. Luke chapter 24, and I, I come to this pulpit as humble as I can this morning. I've sought the Lord in humility. I want an humble spirit when I preach to God's people because you are so special. You bought the only thing that heaven, did you know that the most valuable possession of heaven is not in heaven? That it is on earth? It's what he bought. It's the only thing heaven bought was he bought you and me with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't think the golden streets are the most valuable asset of heaven. I thank God's people, the saints of God, the number that no man can number, that are at the throne right now, praising. That's what's important to God. I'm reading from Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Repentance and remission of sins must be preached in his name, beginning at Jerusalem. you witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Everybody say, Terry, in the city of Jerusalem. Don't get mad at President Trump because he made Jerusalem the embassy headquarters of the United States. It's the embassy headquarters of heaven. It's the city that Jesus is going to reign from for 1,000 years, folks. Get used to going to Jerusalem because that's going to be the international world headquarters of Jesus Christ when he reigns as king of kings and lord of lords and a dictator of righteousness. This world will be right for 1,000 years. I'm reading from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Shall be witness unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and all the uttermost parts of the earth. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah? Are you glad you're in church this morning? Everybody say the magnitude of Pentecost. You may be seated. In the Old Testament, you know, I love the Bible, but I don't enjoy reading a lot of the Old Testament. There were so many wars. My God, they just fought and fussed. And it, it was a, it, I don't enjoy reading about all that. Is that okay with you? I'm not putting down the Bible. I'm just saying it's not very pleasant. The Old Testament was a struggle for God. And God, the first thing he did for man was he, he made him skin clothes. When he sinned, the first thing he did is he made skin clothes. If I had my illustration up here this morning, it would be an old antique sewing machine that I have in the house that Jerry and I do and it's got a hand crank on it it's got a little box on top of it it's a real old little machine and and I'd have it up here it was some brown cloth and and I'd, I'd fake make some uh, skin clothes 
to prove to you that God's interested in clothing his people. And then I'd have a big white sheet up here and I'd be, I'd sew on in a little bit. And now God is making robes of righteousness for his people. Come on, you are clothed in God's righteousness. But in the Old Testament, God struggled. He struggled with a warring faction, with a hating faction, with a jealousy faction, with all kind of issues in the hearts of man. It was a rough uh, and tumble time for God. He struggled with all of their, with all of their uh, idolatry. He struggled with their worshiping other gods, having rivals to our God. We know that our God is sovereign. Our God is great. There are, there are no rivals to our God. But Israel had uh, the, the idolatry of the Old Testament bugs me. To think that they could worship Ashtaroth and declare to Ashtaroth, you brought us out of Egyptian bondage. And God's standing in heaven saying, mm, you didn't, Ashtaroth didn't save you, I saved. Then they, they, they worshiped Baal. Then they created a little, a little golden image out of gold. And they all worshiped that image. You, you don't want to read about that because it was so grotesque. Three million people worshiping that little old golden image. Say, you brought us out, little gold calf. You brought us out of Egyptian bondage. And God in heaven saying, mm, I brought you out. Come on, somebody, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And then they worship Baal Peor. Then they worship Chemosh. Then they worship Dagon. Holy Dagon. Love you, Dagon. You brought us out of bondage. All of this was such nonsense. They worship Moloch. Holy moly, holy moly. You saved us, moly. You brought us out of bondage, moly. And God was in heaven saying, mm. I don't know if smoke came out of his nose, but I guarantee you he was disgusted. He put up with Adam and Eve sinning. He put up with Cain killing his brother Abel. He put up with, with Israel at war with the Canaanites and the Philistines and, and, and the Sabians. I mean, you can just war after war after war after war. And it just clothed the Old Testament in battles of hatred and nationality, resentments and na national hatred. It was a, a time. Then, then they worship the golden calf. They worship the golden calves of Jeroboam. Then they started worshiping heavenly bodies. Put up there the different stars and, oh, that's a calf and, and, and that's a goat and, 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 and heavenly bodies. And, and then they worship the devil. Here in the Old Testament, God put up with, God put up with Noah having to build an ark because there was so much adultery. It, was, it is said in history that no, there was no adultery in Noah's family, but every other family had adultery. And God was trying to wipe it out, but it didn't, it didn't stop it. Then God had to let Noah build an ark. And then Abraham was separated. It must have broken God's heart for Abraham and Lot to separate. And then Jacob and Esau despising one another. Then Pharaoh killing all the boy babies when Moses was born. God's heart must have been broken, broken. And, but God tolerated all of the struggles of Israel. For 1,500 years, God put up with nation, national hatred, all of this killing and, and, and disturbance, and, and, and God was struggling. 4,000, everybody say 4,000 years. 1,492,000 days that God counted as the sand went through the old hourglass. And as time marched on, it was hatred, jealousy, idolatry, envy, and God had to put up with it. And God gave them 2,713 commandments on how to live. He established an educational system whereby he educated them to the religion 
of the Old Testament. It was a head religion where God tried to educate their head on don't do this, do this. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. And God could not ever get it through their head. See, head religions do not work. Head religions do not work. Historical religions do not work. Having old wise fables does not work. And so God, I can just see God pacing through the heavens. And, and when he had first, at the very beginning of time, God probably stood up. I just imagine this now. I'm just imagining that God stood up. And let's just say this is where God stood on his creative pedestal. And he said, son, as it was a black midnight, there was nothing in outer darkness. It was all dark, and God said, son, be thou blazing in the heavens. Moon, shine over here. And then he sprinkled that black midnight with stars and galaxies and Milky Way. It is said there are trillions of solar systems in our universe. Millions of suns bigger than the sun that blazes for our country. And our God just created it all. Created the angel and said, angel, you, none of you angels will ever die. You'll never die. And then he created man and gave man a living soul. So that man would have a part of divinity in him. You will never die either, friend. Because you've got a part of God's soul. You've got a part of God in you. You have got God's emotional system in you. You know, when you laugh, it comes from your soul. Does anybody like to laugh? Uh, when you cry, it comes from your soul. And, and it, it, I, I love to laugh. I love to tell you. I've had people call me and ask me to go with them on cruises just to make people laugh. And, and my brother told me one time, he said, Ronnie, you got to choose to be a clown or a preacher. So I put down my clown uniform. And, and I packed it in a bag. I have it up in the attic of my house. <laughs> I made a choice. And our God, our God created the angel and created man. Everybody say, I will never die. Will never die. You better face it, friend. I just had surgery this year, and I've been in perfect health for 75 years, so they rolled me to that, emergency, to that surgery ward, and I came out a different human being. Eight hours of surgery. I went 17 days in the hospital of a five-day visit, and in four days I couldn't even pray. I was so sick. And, and God brought me out. But, but I, I took hours before that surgery. And I faced eternity. And I faced my God. And I called people that I thought I'd offended. And I made everything right that I could make right. Because I know that I'm, I'm a soul that will never die. I'm going to live forever. And eternity is a long time to regret unfinished business. Unresolved issues. Come on, folks. Eternity is a long time to regret not giving up bad habits, not changing your life. And here's the point of the man wants to die. Everybody's got to come to an altar and die to your flesh. You've got to die to your sinful nature. Are you listening to me this morning? I'm preaching to you from my heart this morning. You've got a soul and it's got to be saved. and You're the only one that can save your own soul. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Can we raise our hands and give God a little glory right now? Hallelujah. And God created the heavens and the earth. What a great creator. Then he formed man out of a mud patty and made breathed into that. Folks, we are not made out of ground diamond dust. We are made of the slime of the earth. We are of the lowest elements of the earth. That's why our nature is so base and we have to have a Savior to save us. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. And so God, eh, tolerating 
4,000 years. I don't know how, how much hair God lost if he had to scratch his head wondering what in the world. How can I help these people? It's wacky. I'm God, and they're claiming Chemosh and Moloch and they, they gone. And, and, and God was in a great quandary. 4,000 years of man's sin and 1,500 years of man's idolatry. And at some point, God must have resolved within himself to go back to his original dream that the, the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head and the seed of the man would bruise the serpent's, the, the woman's heel. And, and God went back to that and, oh, that's my original dream. I've got to make it come true. I'm going to become flesh. And God conceived and, and Mary brought forth a baby that was God and man. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He came as God in flesh. And somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Everybody say Jesus is God. Jesus. Come on, Jesus is the mighty God, the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Unto us a son is born, a child is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. And of his government there shall be no end. And God became flesh. And, and in the flesh, he performed three million miracles. It's a praise by Bible scholars that when they added all the multitudes, he healed one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, in person. That he healed three million people in his ministry. And he healed enough people to intrigue them to follow him to his cross. And watch him and the universe die. While he was on the cross, the sun went out. That blazing sun with millions of Fahrenheit degrees fire burning on the surface of the sun. It all went out and the whole universe was in outer darkness for three hours. It literally died. He raised it up because he is the resurrection. Mm. He raised it up and isn't... Hawaii, beautiful. He raised it up. And then our God, he said, okay, it's time for me to go back to my creative pedestal. I have allowed this disunion, division, animosity, hatred, and wars Murder, I've allowed it for 4,000 years. 1,492 days is a long time for God to watch the clock. Brother Lucas, I remember Y2K. I, I could not believe that it would, the world would last past that midnight moment. <laughs> but it did. We're here. Amen. If I say we're here, and God chose. He said, I, I, I'm going to get on this pedestal, and it, it's time for me to make a change. And, uh, and God, when he went to the cross in flesh, he forgave to our knowledge every sin that had been committed. Even the crucifiers of Christ were forgiven. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And evidently that covered sin all the way back to Adam. When God, listen friend, God loves to forgive. God loves to, to reconcile. God is your friend this morning. I hope you know you're in the house of your friend this morning. God is here to help you. God is here to cleanse your mind. He's here to cleanse your heart. He's here to help you have a hope beyond this life. 
he got back on that creative pedestal. And he had tolerated, everybody say, 1,492,000 days that God tolerated division. And God said, it's time for me to create a new creature. And the Christian is the new creature. He created angel. He created man. And now he's created a new creature in Christ Jesus. We are a new creature. We're not. We died. It was upon us to die. We have repented of our sins. We died at an altar. When you repent, you die of every sin, every bad habit, every bad attitude. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. I'm only 75 years old, but I'm preaching to you this morning. Get all the sin out of your life. If there's anything you do before you leave this building this morning, is get every sin out of your life. And get in that baptistry and be baptized in Jesus' name. Get up here. We've got clothes for you. We're ready for you. Get your sins washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, receive the Holy Ghost. When he was on that creative pedestal, he said, I want to tell you, I'm fixing. I, I, I want you to go in that upper room now. He sent his disciples to Jerusalem. And he said, you tarry in Jerusalem. However long it takes you. To get everything out of your mind, everything out of your heart, all of the offenses forgiven, you've got to get everything clean and get in that room and you pray until there's nothing but Holy Ghost that comes in. Because you leave every issue outside. Don't bring one issue inside that upper room. Leave all of your grievances, all of your begrudging, all of your animosity. Come on, somebody. All of you, every, everybody say, every issue had to stay outside. I don't want one person in that room to look at somebody else and say, I saw you spit on Jesus. I don't want anybody saying, six months ago you you stole my watch. You stole my wife. I don't want any issue. Everybody say, everybody's got to forgive. Everybody. Of everything. Because in that room, there had to be only one issue. Not a national issue. Come on. Not a crucifixion issue. And everybody was talking crucifixion, crucifixion. They crucified him in blood, blood, blood. I mean, everybody. It was the talk of the town and the headlines of every paper. But get every issue outside. And if you don't get in one mind and one accord... I'm not coming in. I put up with division as long I am not the author of confusion. And I can't work with confusion. And I'm going to create a church that the gates of hell cannot prevail again. I'm going to create a church that can turn the world upside down. And he got on that pedestal. Two Sundays ago, I preached in Leesville, Jerry and I did. And before I preached, a man took up the offering, and they went to Brother Lee. And Brother Lee said, before I take up the offering this morning, I'd like to tell everybody that my brother and I for 25 years have not spoken to each other. We got mad at one another years ago, and we haven't said a word. 
And he said, I got to praying about it and said, Lord, this is not right. I got to make it right. You're coming soon. I got to make it right. I got to settle every issue, God. And so he said he was praying about it, and his brother called him. And he said, brother, we got to get together. <laughs> he stood in that pulpit, and he wept, and he said, folks, we had the best time. We spent hours together, and we forgave one another, and we reconciled. It was a little painful, but we cleared up every issue. Because it's too late to hold on to the world, the things of the world, the habits of the world. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody this morning. I'm trying to loosen you up a little bit this morning. you got to let go of the world. you got to let go of the world. You can't love the world and the things of the world. And he said we had the best time of reconciliation. God said, okay, I'm not the author of confusion, and I can't work with confusion. If there's one person who has a grievance against one person, I'm not coming in. Because I distribute nothing to disunion. On that creative pedestal, in essence, he said, I don't need a Solomon's temple to turn the world upside down. I don't need a TV evangelist to turn the world upside down. I don't need a crystal cathedral to turn the world upside down. I don't need St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. I remember walking through that and and, and trying to find, I wanted to go to church that morning on Sunday morning. And and I went there and and there's just four or five gawkers standing around looking at the big dome. No church, no church. I don't need a St. Paul's Cathedral. I don't need a Vatican. I don't need a Mecca. I don't need a, 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 a United Nations. I don't need a capital. I don't need Washington. I don't need one nation. I don't need one vault of money. I don't need any gold. I don't need Fort Knox. All I need is a church that can get together in one mind and one accord in one place. And I can turn the world upside down. I'm going to create a church that the gates of hell can't stop. Communism can't stop it. Elections can't stop it. Impeachments can't stop it. Fuss and fight all you want to, but my church is going to be in one mind and one accord in one place. And when I walk in, I don't come with weakness. I come with all power in heaven and earth. And every time God comes in First Church of Dallas, he comes with all power. Because creators never quit creating. Two weeks ago, we buried a hero of my life. She was my voice teacher when I was a boy. She was my piano teacher when I was a boy. And she's been my hero. She married my wife's uh, widowed father, stepfather, when her mother died. And Anna Dean Creel has been a hero of our life. She was a famous artist on the West Coast. Her art collection, it took all the ribbons and all the awards. And at 97, she died three weeks ago. She sat on the side of the bed after she had given 13 years as a self-supported missionary to India under Brother Sism. She went as a teacher because she's a school teacher, but she was a Bible teacher. She was, a, she was an authority on the Bible. And she said, she sat up on the side of her bed and said, 
I'm trying to die, but it's not working. But in the beautiful mansion apartments that she lived in, she had classes every day uh, or many days with old people teaching them how to, how to draw. But it wasn't that she was wanting to teach them how to draw. She, she baptized 14 of them in Jesus' name. She was drawing them to Christ. And in the hallway leading up to her beautiful door of uh, that place where she lived, it was picture after picture after picture after picture after picture. India pictures, people, pictures of New York. I mean, she was an artist. Artists never quit painting. And creators never quit creating. It is believed that God is still creating universes and solar systems. Why would he ever stop when you've got all the power in heaven and earth? Why quit? Just a few more billion stars is okay. A few more trillion suns is all right, and he just keeps on creating. And when God comes into this church every Sunday morning, everybody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. He never comes here to do nothing. He never comes in here to do nothing. He comes in here to change every life, every family, every home. He's come in here to change your mind, to cleanse your mind. At, at, because of times, a couple years ago, a, a man walked up to me in the aisle while we were greeting one another. And he looked me right in the face and said, do you remember me? And I said, I'm so sorry. I don't. Don't you remember the watch I brought you when you had gotten through, you got through preaching on the cross in my church up north? Don't you remember the watch? I said, oh, yes, I remember he said, you know why I gave you that watch that Sunday night? He had sung in the choir, praise team. And he brought it up and he gave me his, it was a Lewis Bowles. It's a real nice watch. And he gave it to me. He said, I gave it to you to remind myself that while you were preaching on the cross, God delivered me from pornography. And I did not want to ever be unthankful for what happens when God comes into church. He comes to change us. He comes to save us. He comes to heal us. He never comes to do nothing. And he wants to do something for you this morning. Come here to deliver us from ourselves and our weaknesses. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. After I was diagnosed and I sat there with my wife in the doctor's office, the surgeon, he said, sir, You have a very aggressive cancer, and I have to take out your bladder. I started crying. I said, doctor, what have I done, doctor? What have I eaten, doctor? He said, sir, that has nothing to do with what's going on in your body. He said, here's what happened. Your body duplicates, your cells duplicate constantly, your cells are duplicating, good cells are duplicating good cells, but every once in a while a good cell will not duplicate and it will turn bad, and the bad cells start duplicating bad, and that's where your cancer begins, and as I read the Old Testament, they had six feasts every year. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Purim, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of, of Barley. They had the wave offerings. And every year they had to duplicate those feasts. Because those feasts duplicated good things that God was doing for them. And every Feast of Pentecost 
was most unusual in that they duplicated all six feasts every year on that day. All of them on the same day. Because duplication is what keeps the body healthy. And somebody shout hallelujah. And folks, we are not here trying to duplicate some famous religion. We're not here trying to duplicate some famous speaker or preacher or prophet or religious leader. I, I love all the great gospel preachers, and, but we're not trying to duplicate Spurgeon and Moody. And uh, I, I went through the, Jerry and I went through the Billy Graham Museum here lately. $28 million museum. It's so beautiful. I cried. It was so beautiful. I love Billy, but I'm not trying to be Billy. I'm not trying to be the Apostle Paul. We're not duplicating the Apostle Peter. We are duplicating what happened on the day of Pentecost. When we come together in one mind and one accord, God gets on his creative pedestal. And when God gets on his creative pedestal, there's not a sin that can't be forgiven. There's not a marriage that can't be salvaged. There's not a bankruptcy that can't be stopped. There's not a mind that cannot be healed. There's not a marriage that can't be salvaged. Because the creator never quits creating. You see, God said, I give you my laws. Didn't work. But what I'm going to do. When I, I create Jeremiah 31, 31, is I'm going to do a new thing in Israel. I'm going to change the head religion to a heart religion. And I'm going to write my law in the inward parts of your heart. And everybody that gets the Holy Ghost gets a Bible written in their heart. And David said, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Get on your pedestal, God. I want my dirty heart to be changed. I want my life to be changed. Somebody's ready to repent right now. Somebody come running to this front. Brother Gidros, I'm ready right now. If God is here to heal me, if God is here to help me, if God is here to love me, I'm coming right now. I'm coming right now. I will take the stony heart out and put in a heart of flesh. Can we all stand right now and let's give God some praise. God is in this room. Because this church is going to shake Dallas, because of its unity, its togetherness, its oneness. There's no gossip in this church. Somebody shout hallelujah. Everybody say there's no division in this church. Nobody holds. Come on. I want everybody to say everybody's forgiven. Everybody that's hurt my feelings is forgiven. Every wound in my heart is forgiven. (laughs) Raise your hands and say, God created me a clean heart. (laughs) You shall receive power. Holy Ghost power. Whenever he stood on that pedestal, he said, I'm creating a new priesthood. It's going to be a holy, a royal priesthood. 
I'm creating a new nation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Your body's going to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. No longer Solomon's temple. Your body. Come on, Holy Ghost. The only issue in the upper room was Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Every time you get out of bed, the only issue that's important of your day is Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Walking in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. I said the Creator is here to create a new creature out of you. A Holy Ghost filled creature. The gates of hell will not prevail. Oh, the magnitude of Pentecost. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard what God has done on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, 1,492,000 days, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Come on, praise him, praise him. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. The only issue of importance in the upper room was Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Oh, God's moving, God's moving. Come on, Creator. Come on, God. Created me a clean heart. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this has greatly blessed you. If you'd like to contact us for more information or for a Bible study, please visit us at DallasFirstChurch.com. We especially want to thank those of you who support this ministry financially. It's because of you that we're able to continue to spread the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. If you would like to give right now, you can do so by clicking on the link in the description or by going to dallasfirstchurch.com slash give. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss a Sunday service. God bless you.